Thanks for the kind introduction, and it's uh, great to be with, with all of you today. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been 17 years that uh, we've gone through this process, but it's always been a, a wonderful process uh, and a great privilege to serve the people of uh, West Michigan. Diane, and Diane is here with me this morning, and we have thoroughly enjoyed uh, and continue to enjoy the opportunity to serve West Michigan. As Jim talked about, you know, the... Uh, we're going through tough times. We're going through tough times in Washington. Uh, we're going through tough times as a country. You know, you've got, uh, you know, people say a couple of wars going on. And actually, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's a war going on, this threat from radical jihadism. Uh, it's in Pakistan, it's in Afghanistan, it's in Somalia, it's in Yemen, uh, it's in Europe, and as we've seen more recently, it's also now starting to rear its ugly head back in the United States one more time. You take a look at the crisis that we are facing uh, from an economic standpoint, 10.1% uh, unemployment, uh, nationally 15.2% unemployment uh, here in the state of Michigan. Uh, and as I go around the state, you know, and you hear these stories, they are stories from a personal standpoint, you know, people hurting. Uh, and as Jim said, people who really do believe and are looking for some hope, and it's hard for them to find some hope. Uh, and so I think right now, and this is where it's so important for people like yourselves to actually be involved in the political process and express your opinions and your views. Because from my perspective, you know, we are right back to where we were perhaps uh, the first time in 1993, talking about some of the issues and where we are headed uh, as a nation. It is a fundamental debate about how we are going to bring back our economy. And it is a debate uh, about two very, very distinct and different visions for America. Uh, and I believe that at a national level and at a state level, we need to embrace economic growth. You know, I think for, as I talk to people, uh, you know, I hear all the time about the barriers uh, that have been put up to economic growth, uh, the challenges to economic growth. Uh, and what we have seen in the state of Michigan is we have seen what happens when we don't have economic growth. There have been people say, well, you know, you're putting fear into people or, you know, this group's fear putting, and putting scare tactics into place. The scare tactic is if we don't have economic growth, we don't have the money for our schools, we don't have the money uh, for our infrastructure. We don't have the money to fund the things that are important to us as a state or as a nation. We need to embrace economic growth. We have to embrace, we have to embrace the concept that we have to provide entrepreneurs the freedom to invest, to grow, and to prosper. And in many ways, I think we need to go get back to Economics 101. And what does that mean? Let me just, I want to talk with you today about four points that I think are, are, are fundamental if we're going to get back and, and share with you the couple of different visions uh, that the country and the state are choosing uh, between today. The first is I want to talk about capital. Uh, and that capital is mobile. And I think that so many people today in America believe that capital is static. I want to talk a little bit about the difference of vision between free enterprise and government-run businesses. Uh, I want to talk about making sure that we have alignment between the federal, the state, and local government. And I want to talk about the, the need to, to differentiate between what's done at the federal level what's done at a state level, and what's done at a local level. And I think if we address these four issues, it will give people the opportunity to have hope uh, because we can fundamentally turn the economy around. You know, I, I woke up this morning and I uh, turned on the news for a minute and I heard the president describe Jim and some of the others of you that are here that work in the banking industry, describe you as fat cats. I thought, well, that's interesting. Here we are struggling as an economy, and what the White House is going to do is we're going to go after the business community and start calling them names. Now, over the last year, I've spent a lot of time with businesses, and I've spent a lot of time talking to bankers. And 
I think I've got a little bit of an understanding of the problem because, yeah, the government has put a tremendous amount of money into the banking community, but this is a case where we don't have alignment. The federal government has put a tremendous amount of money into certain banks through TARP, and then at the same time, the regulators have come in and said, you know, the banking industry is struggling, so to make sure that we don't have any bad debt, what we're going to do is we're going to raise the ratios, meaning we're going to have to improve, you're, you're going to have to improve your ratios. You're going to have to set aside more capital to make sure that you can demonstrate to us that you're a solid bank. So at one hand, the government is putting money in and at the other man, so to facilitate lending. And on the other hand, the government is going in and saying, by the way, you've got to improve your ratios so you can't lend as much money. But the bottom line here is it's not about that particular problem. But I think it's a, it's a discussion in an issue about how government views business. And rather than enter, entering into a rational discussion with business and having a discussion with the bankers today in the White House, not about their salaries or those types of things, it is about, hey, what do we need to do to facilitate you to loan again because I don't think bankers and businesses are irrational people. If they felt that they could go into the market and loan money and make money on that process, they would do it. They're not just doing this out of spite to an administration or to the government or whatever, but capital is mobile. We have to create an environment and government needs to create an environment where people want to invest in the United States because if we don't create that environment in the United States, capital will move from the United States and it will move to China, it will move to Russia, it will move to India, it will, move, it will go someplace where it can get a return on its investment. It will move from Michigan to Indiana to South Carolina, it will move from Holland to Grand Rapids to somewhere else in the state if you don't create an environment. Capital, you need to remove the barriers to investment. You need to make sure that you can get a return and you have to recognize that it is mobile. And this is, you know, it's a fundamental lesson, but sir, there are so many people in America today who believe that capital is static, that it doesn't move. As I go around the state and talk to people, I am amazed by the barriers that we have put up at the national level, the state level, and the local level to people who want to invest and grow jobs in this state. And some people will come back and say, well, Pete, you know, because I, I talk about if you want to get this state moving, get rid of some of the bureaucracy, get rid of some of the rules and the regulations. And some folks will come back and say, hey, well, Pete, you know, that's really not much of a vision or that's not much of a problem. And quite often, it's, that's the comment that you get from from bigger businesses because they can go back and they can maybe absorb some of the costs. But you've got to recognize that in a state like Michigan, 98% of the businesses in Michigan are small businesses. I was with, with someone last night and he said, hey, I just got my tax bill on some property, 46,000 bucks. It's unimproved property. They're hoping someday to be building houses on this property. But right now they're not. But he's got a huge tax bill. And he said, I got the court case that says, you know, this property should be taxed at a different rate. The Supreme Court of Michigan has said that. The local official said, that's great, take us to court. Small businesses can't compete against government. If you get into a fight with government, Government will win if you are a small business. You don't have the resources, you don't have the time, and you don't have the talent. We have to create an environment and remove the barriers so that small business can grow. We need to create certainty. If you take a look at where we are for capital investment in the United States, how many of you would invest in the United States today? Do we have a lot of certainty? I think it was uh, even uh, some of the president's advisors uh, and some other folks were talking about the we don't know where America is going to be in 12 months. Some, I'm sure that in the stack of questions that I've got here, someone's going to ask, where's health care? I don't know. We have no idea where we're going to be on health care. We have no idea as to where we are going to be in cap and trade. But we do know that if we move forward in certain one direction or another direction, there will be significant changes 
in what your costs will be and how you will run your business depending on what happens with health care and what happens with cap and trade. You know, it is an issue that we've not created certainty. And then you take a look at the other thing that's going on. Capital wants a return. Think about what we're doing on a federal level. Health care, all kinds of tax increases. Cap and trade. Lower your costs, increase your costs. In the Midwest, it's going to hammer the Midwest. Another federal tax. What's going to happen with the Bush tax cuts? They are gone. What's going to happen? You know, there's a, a new financial services tax that they're talking about. Because in many ways, they would consider any of us that own investments and that we may trade stocks or bonds or whatever as fat cats. We ought to put a tax on each financial transaction. And then there's talk about a 5% war tax. Will that make it easier or more difficult for you to get a return on your investment if you decide to invest in jobs? So capital is not only mobile from China to the US and around the world, it is also mobile from being actively engaged in growing the economy and growing jobs. And what we've done in the United States and what we've done in Michigan today is we have moved capital not from one area to another. What we've moved capital to is, in many cases, we've moved capital from being actively involved in growing our economy to sitting on the sidelines and saying, we're going to wait until we get answers to some of these issues. So we can, I, I fully expect that the economy is going to be in rough shape for the, next, for the next year. I don't see us doing much in Washington, and I don't see us doing much in Lansing that is going to enable capital to move or encourage capital move off of the sidelines into the market because we've addressed some of these issues. Take a look at another thing. And, you know, take a look at federal government enterprise versus free enterprise. Make no doubt about it, if health care passes the way that it passes, if health care the way that it went through the House of Representatives makes it to the President's desk, we in one bill will take 17 percent of the economy and we will move it under government control. One bill. Cap and trade. You know, they can't get it done legislatively, so now they're going to do it through a regulatory process, cutting carbon emissions by 17 percent. A massive increase in the cost of business, but it'd be government mandated and government run. Then you take a look at what's happened with the auto industry, what they want to do with banks, what they want to do with financial services. We are at a kind of a crossroads as to whether we believe that Free enterprise, as imperfect as it is, is a more efficient way to manage the economy versus government or state-run enterprises. That is the kind of crossroads that we are in today. You know, I find it kind of interesting, the, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, things that I've been going after for 12 or 13 years, uh, federal prison industries. You know, I, I go up to Traverse City and there's a small little garment factory and I walk in and I see that two-thirds of their machines are empty. And I talk to the guy, he says, yeah, our business was going great. And what happened? He said, we were doing so well, we were on the verge of getting another contract. I leased another building, bought some more sewing machines. I've got a building just like this one, you know, across the street that I thought was going to be full of people sewing garments for the military. And all I've got now is I've got one building that's one-third full. What happened? Federal prison industries came in and took all my business. Some of you may have seen that Unisolar laid off 400 employees the last couple of weeks. This is the bright spot in the Michigan's economy up in Greenville. And I saw that they laid off 400 workers and we were just talking about federal prison industries, and my staff came in and said, hey, Pete, here's their latest brochure. What's their latest brochure? Their latest brochure is they are 
driving green jobs. And they're doing solar energy. Oh, I thought that's interesting. So I had my staff call Unisolar and said, hey, you know, do you guys compete with federal prison industries? And they said, we don't even know what federal prison industries is. And so we sent them the brochure and they called back and we talked to them for a little while and they said, you know what? We don't compete with them. At Unisolar, we make the latest high-tech design. You know, we are state of the art. What federal prison industries is making is they're making stuff that's two or three generations old. So we don't compete with them. High tech versus, you know, some outdated stuff. We said, fine. You know, we just thought that maybe it might have had an impact on your business. They called back two days later and said, you know what? We've talked to our sales force. We think we need to come in and talk with you. I said, really, why? They said, well, we've noticed that over the last six, nine months, that every spec that is coming out of federal prison, every spec that's coming out of the federal government, we no longer qualify for. That the only people that qualify for these projects are the people that are made, the federal specs now don't call for state of the art, they're calling for the old stuff, the crystal stuff, not the film stuff. So they came in and we met with them last week and said, well, that's exactly what Federal Prison Industries is doing. They are going in, they're writing the spec to buy their stuff, and then they're claiming the business so you can't even compete for the business. The good news for us is we have one more company on our coalition uh, to fight Federal Prison Industries. Uh, one more example of people in Michigan who are losing jobs because of Federal Prison Industries. The bad thing is, 400 people in the private sector losing their jobs because the government has come in and is competing with them in an unfair basis. That is the kind of problem that we are facing in D.C. and that you're facing as a business. But the fundamental issue right now for the private sector, and this is where the business community has never been very good. You've got to stand up for free enterprise or government's going to take over. And the, what I, when I talk about not been very good, what do I mean? I mean that business people are willing to throw the business next to them under the bus as long as they get theirs. Business needs to make the decision that we are either for free enterprise for all of us or we are for free enterprise for none of us. If you don't stand up for the banking community and their right to be involved in a free enterprise and competitive marketplace today, it will be your industry that is thrown under the bus tomorrow. If you're not willing to stand up for docs and hospitals and insurance companies today and say, there may be some problems, but let's solve this through a free market, free enterprise solution, then tomorrow it will be yours. If government can run health care, you know, when I went to Washington, you may remember in 1993 we had this debate. And I said, I'll be ready to have government run health care when they run the automobile industry. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh no, it's happened. They now run, they now run health, or they now run the automobile industry, and now they're going to run. Uh, you know, so now they could come back and if they could find my quotes, they would say, you know, we ran, you said when we ran the automobile industry, you'd be more than willing to have them run health care. And it's kind of like, yeah, I did say that, but you know, that's wrong. They shouldn't be running either one. But I think that is a fundamental issue that we're having today. The third issue I want to just touch briefly is federalism. If we want to get the economy moving again, we've got to shrink government. And it can be done. And I'll give you three quick examples. It's at the federal level, but it also works at the state level. I have no need for no child left behind in the federal government telling me what schools work in Michigan and what schools work and what teachers are good teachers in Holland. That is a state and a local issue. 35 cents of every education dollar that you send to Washington, D.C. gets eaten up in bureaucracy. 
Washington telling a state and telling a local school what to do, the school reporting back to Washington, yes, we did it, the federal government sending an auditor back to the local school district and saying, we don't believe you, we're going to check on it, uh, and then the local school district reporting back and after they getting audited. It is a pure waste of money and bureaucracy, and if we want to get the economy going, we've got to put more money back into the hands of people and take it out of government. You know, there's all this talk now, and some of my friends in the state legislature uh, are working on this race to the top, okay? The federal government bribing states to do something that maybe some of us agree with are, are good things, expanding charter schools and all that, but the fundamental principle of, his, of it is wrong. The federal government taking our money and bribing us to do things we otherwise might or might not do, promising us, promising us $400 million. If you go to race to the top, it is a race to government control, more government control of K through 12 education. Because depending on how you count it, it's 25, 50, or 100 more mandates on the state or the school districts that receive the money. I don't think you'll find anybody in a K through 12 school district today that says we need more mandates. It's the same thing with highway funding. The purpose of the highway transportation uh, bill was to build an interstate system. That is a good thing for the federal government to do, connect all 50 states. Um, we still got to build the bridge to Hawaii, but once that gets done, there's really no need for this organization anymore. But to build an interstate highway system, it is the right thing to do. In the history of the highway bill, the highway bill so roughly over 50 years, Michigan has contributed $4 billion more than what we've gotten back. You wonder why other states do better than what we do. In the history of the program, we've averaged 83 cents. West Virginia, a buck 74. That's for 50 years. They've taken our money and sent it somewhere else. There's a better way to do this. We're now at a point where I think we don't need the federal government to come in to take our money, siphon a good part of it off, send it somewhere else and then come back to Michigan and say, oh, by the way, you know, you need to use some of this money to, to build roads, you need some of it to replace signs, you need some of it to do new guardrails, and by the way, you're going to use some of the money now uh, also to build turtle fences, to build new rest areas and those kinds of things here. We're going to tell you how to spend your money, at least the money, your money, the part of it that we're going to give back to you. Do the same thing with job training. You know, we need a total overhaul at the federal level, the state level, and local level so that we embrace economic growth, that we, that we allow people to grow their economy, that we want them to invest, that we create an, that we create an attractive environment at the federal level, the state level, and the local level to invest to move capital in these areas. We need to get that kind of alignment. And once we do that, that's why, you know, you take a look at this state. You know, if we, if we had a different relationship, an improved relationship, and it's a different focal point and different relationship with the federal government, if we embrace growth and said, we are going to create an environment where people are going to want to come to Michigan, and they are going to want to invest in Michigan because we have tremendous resources, but we've actually created an environment where we've provided them with some certainty, we have removed barriers to investment, and we are going to allow people to get a fair return on their investment. People will come back to Michigan. It can happen. It can happen. It can happen, I think, relatively quickly. The most disappointing thing was a couple of weeks ago, you saw what? I think a research study out of Ann Arbor that said it's going to take, you know, Michigan could be... A, in this state for 15 years. Michigan could be in this state for 25 years. And again, they look at it as kind of a static environment. It is not a static environment. What Michigan is in 15 years and what Michigan is in 25 years will depend on what we do and the kind of leadership that we as a group will exert in this state. It is not a static is not a static situation. It will depend on the decisions that we make today and we can turn the state around and we can turn the country around. We need to embrace economic growth. We need to embrace opportunity. 
<clears throat> we need to in embrace free enterprise, and we need to do it at every level of government. We need to do it at a federal level, we need to do it at a state level, and then we need to do it at a local level. And if we go back to the roots of who we are, not only will we bring this economy back from the disaster that we are in today, we will bring Michigan back from the depression that we are in today, and we will reignite West Michigan, and we will all be able to move forward. That's the kind of vision uh, that I think that we can share as a business group, that we can share as a community, that we can share as a state, and that we can share as a country. But on each of those decisions, the decision point is now. Will we embrace economic growth? Will we embrace free enterprise? Will we embrace less government? And will we mandate, not mandate, will we put in place the incentives so that people at all of those levels of government will align themselves and say, we are going to work together to bring this economy back and to bring this country back. That's the challenge that we face. It's a challenge we face over the next 12 months and the decisions that we will make over the next 12 months. There are two very, very different visions uh, in Washington, D.C. There are two very different visions in the state of Michigan. We've seen where, the vision, where one vision in the state of Michigan has taken us over the last seven years, and I think we're seeing where, the other, where that same vision in Washington has taken us over the last 12 months. That's the challenge that we face, and uh, the challenge that I face is reading your questions and seeing where we go. And next year we're gonna have, for the last year, we will have bigger print, all right? <laughs> Hey, great. Thank you. You guys have been great friends. Diane and I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas, a blessed holiday season. Thank you. Pete, thank you very much. Yeah.